Hey everyone, this is Matt with Simplistic Reviews for another Simplistic Interview live, quote unquote, from the uh, Fantasia Film Festival. Uh, we're going into the first weekend or almost getting towards you know, the first couple of days of the fest. And uh, anybody who's been uh, following the site for interviews, um, been interviewing some pretty cool first time filmmakers and I have a surprise. I have another first time filmmaker for you today. Um, he is the director of the upcoming world premiere screening of uh, The Paper Tigers. This is Bao Tran. How are you doing today, Bao? I'm doing fine, Matt. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Yeah. How's uh, the West Coast? How's uh, Seattle treating you right now? The West Coast is the best-ish coast uh, <laughs> right now. We're doing okay. We have four, um, in addition to a pandemic, of course, we're having kind of summer forest fires. So that's going to get real interesting for the summer. And we have these crazy thunderstorms that are coming in as well. So um Hey man, keep it interesting. That's what we like to, to do. Are we, are we <laughs> surprised by anything that's going to be happening anymore? <laughs> it's <know>? just, <laughs> yeah, because what was the other thing I read? That uh, there was some, um, I guess, uh, NASA scientists have said there's a chance that a six and a half foot asteroid might be hitting us maybe soon. Oh, they, say, they said, hey, don't worry, it's not going to be a deep impact or anything, but there, it's a, I think they said it's a 0 0.14 chance of it hitting uh, the Earth. So, oh, okay, yeah. Just Shock be it a up. Gash. Yeah, not just a, a gap. Yeah, yeah, depending on fine. who, depending on who it hits, beauty it might mark. not may not be a, a beauty mark. You know, yeah, nary, nary a beauty mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, looking uh, forward to it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as I, much yeah, as I exactly. look forward to everything else. Yeah, I hope that didn't bring the whole interview down or anything like that. It's like, oh no, oh, no another no, thing no, to worry about. We can't go any lower point. now. We're, we're already there. <laughs> we'll just keep digging, digging a little exactly. deeper. We we'll see how deep we can go. This. So, exactly. Well, uh, thank you for joining us. Of course, the circumstances are interesting and crazy and the often uh, over cliched new normal. This is pretty much how interviews have been going on and everything uh, with the film festival. And as much as we'd like to be sitting across the room, probably recording this, you know, face to face, but uh, this is what we have uh, to work with. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about you getting started. Um, as I as I uh, alluded to, this is your first feature, uh, the Paper Tigers. Um, however, you have been in the film industry for for quite a while. You know, working with a lot of great actors. I mean, you you kind of cut your teeth with, you know, Corey Corey Yoon and everything like that, doing uh, you know, um, martial arts things, stunt coordinate stunt coordinating and everything. So, um, how did that get you ready for your first feature film? Kind of working with him getting his blessings kind of, I don't want to say being his, uh, you know, uh, kind of protege in some ways, but you know, you, you kind of were. So uh, take us back, take us all the way back to your love for, you know, Kung Fu flicks and everything that kind of goes uh, hand in hand with this film. Yeah. I mean, a uh, big fan of martial arts films. So this is kind of a, a fitting a first feature, if you will, for me to kind of be able to tell the story and tell kind of a biographical story about that. Um, Corey Yoon, is, you know, I've never worked with him formally on a show or anything, but it was mm -hmm. always uh, this like informal mentorship. So a lot of it was a little bit school of hard knocks. Uh, you know, <laughs> I would make these videos. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be a family friend. So I, I'd make these videos and just show him, ask for his feedback. And this was like as a teenager. Yeah. So, you know, it's pretty cringy now looking back on the stuff that was done but he he was he humored me and he listened he watched it and gave me notes gave me ideas gave me a way to kind of think about things and that you know i'm forever indebted uh, to him that in that regard and in that sense just kind of really shaped the way i think about movies because uh the way he would say it was almost kind of like if you didn't have um good story you can't have good action mm -hmm. so it doesn't mean anything to kind of create a, a cool action scene or a cool fight uh, with moves if you don't really understand what's going on with characters or the story or the stakes and stuff like that so that kind of really just really opened my mind it's like oh huh it's not just cool wires <laughs> exactly it's you like kind of do that the one, yeah. when you, you first do that and you're like yeah it's all about the cool flips <laughs> and stuff and then you kind of think about well you know how exactly is everything put together and the more important why is everything put together so that really set my way as far as thinking about you know how how to make movies and how to tell a story um so that was huge for me um and you know i just from that what you had just mentioned you know i just kind of made movies on my own in the backyard and um not really any formal for film school other than you know these kind of mem 
these kind of mentorships and um, just started making my own films, my own short films. And uh, if you, you may or may not be familiar with there's, there's kind of a uh, Asian American uh, community of filmmakers who oftentimes do it despite their previous generations or do it despite their, yeah. their, their, <laughs> their upbringing because yeah. an artistic upbringing is kind of unheard of. Like I'm not from a showbiz family, you know, and I know yeah. several, some, several people who are, so it's, I, I don't, my family or my, my history has no connections to films. So to even begin to making films, like what does that even mean? How did it start or how to like get, get even anywhere with it. So a lot of that was like trial and error. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was like just, um, learning and then burning <laughs> crashing and burning a lot of course uh and then just figuring out as we go um and just also finding community so i mentioned with asian american i'm vietnamese mm -hmm. um by ethnicity but i was born here um so we were able to make a lot of connections with each other and my producer alan dong is actually also vietnamese american from you know the same hometown that i was from but we actually didn't cross paths until you know, our late, our mid twenties, mm -hmm. uh, ironically. So, um, you know, we just find ourselves in different ways. So in that regard, there was film festivals and, um, communities and arts organizations for Asian Americans, for Vietnamese Americans that, um, brought us all together. Um, so I built a lot of, um, my friendships through that as I was coming up. And as part of that, um, Vietnam had been is still undergoing this huge kind of like economic boom mm -hmm. and kind of a growth spurt in terms of coming out in terms of into the world that being more globalized and creating more films and, and more more um, how, how would you say big budgeted films yeah. for an audience that's hungry to go see it because now the the younger class is growing up who want to go to movies and stuff like that so it's actually quite booming. Uh, in Vietnam, the theater experience, whereas here in the U.S., we might see it as kind of a trickling down and not really, you know, losing to streaming and whatnot. Uh, but in, in in Vietnam, it's, you know, very similar to Bollywood or something like yeah. that, where people want to go to see the theaters, to movies in theaters and stuff like that. Um, so a lot of uh, my peers and my age, grade and my group um, have gone back to Vietnam to work um, either as uh directors, writers, mm -hmm. or DPs, or actors, and stuff like that, but also kind of bringing the kind of, I guess, American the polish of film, the, yeah, the look, Hollywood a lot of concept, them, yep, and so a lot of them were like USC uh, uh, film grads and stuff like that, and then going to Vietnam and kind of bringing their, their talents and stuff, so I was fortunate to kind of follow some of my friends and, and work for a little bit out there, and, and I, as an editor, so mm -hmm. I cut two films out there, one a big action movie and one a big comedy movie um and uh and i just kind of learned the ropes as far as like what that whole thing is almost in in miniature because you see mm -hmm. studio filmmaking but in a very directed um way because you could it's for vietnamese audiences the stores are not we know we're not going to go internationally we know it's not like you know the big hollywood type of film mm -hmm. so it's it's a very different flavor when you have some freedom to cater to the local audience um and and tell stories that are very specific to you know and tell jokes you know that yeah. are specific to, and slang that is very specific to that culture so that was like a real learning curve as far as like understanding um this whole booming culture so it, it's still interesting uh, to this day i'm still fascinated by it i still have friends and connections that are there so it's always interesting kind of following what's happening there as a parallel in terms of cinema our yeah. national cinema um so yeah so that's kind of the long story short in terms of you know where where i've been and this story at, with the paper tires already had it as a script or as an idea before mm -hmm. i first left for vietnam and then i just started working a lot and i just felt it came to a time I just had to come back to it and actually just sit down and write it and commit to it and actually be uh, be able to be uh, direct it as my first feature um, so that was kind of like a real kind of shift in commitment on that and because you know um, it was really exciting to be in yeah. Vietnam <laughs> so. <laughs> well it's interesting I mean uh, I, I'm uh... I, I know the Bollywood experience and things like that mm -hmm. and even kind of like the, you know Indonesian films and everything like that that's mm -hmm. you know ever since the raid, I would say is like, yeah, you no, know, that whole, that whole region is kind of blown up with the action films and everything, uh, martial arts. 
Now, um, now that you've kind of directed a film, the Amer I guess I, I'm, I guess I can say the American style. And then how was it in Vietnam? I mean, because um, you're also only kind of, I don't want to say you're only appealing to like, it's one nationality. So you, you're not really, yeah. Yeah. you know, um, it, it's here in America, it's a melting pot, you know, Italians, Americans, Asians, you know, uh, Hispanics, you know, African-Americans. There's so many people to kind of cater to and to kind of work and make sure the movie's liked by everybody. Whereas in Vietnam, you know, it, it's the Vietnamese culture, you know, uh, and yeah. I don't, Unfortunately, I don't know much about Vietnamese culture, yep. but uh, I know it's probably very, it's, it's, it's singular, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm going to say homogenous for lack of a better term. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but how, how was that kind of working in Vietnam? I guess, looking back in hindsight, now that you finished like your first feature, are you like, man, I want to go back to Vietnam now? <laughs> are you kind of like that? <laughs> or are you like, okay, I'm happy with where I'm at, where I'm at right now? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Well, you know, the, but I think the bottom line is obviously the dollar goes a longer way. Mm -hmm. So your budgets and equivalents of, of labor and the type of uh, production um, value that you had in film, you could go a long way mm -hmm. uh, when you make it a film in Vietnam. So obviously that one is a leg up in terms of being able to tell the stories that are more on a bigger scale, or, you know, you can get, you know, certain access to multi-camera shoots and, and, and sets and production and all that stuff. So, um, the scale of, of making the film is much more accessible. Um, but yeah, like you're saying, it is, it is a monoculture, obviously this, you know, one language that kind of like is what you're telling the story tour and, uh, it has its pros and cons. I'll be mm -hmm. honest, you know, it has, uh, it's wonderfully vibrant because it's just so energetic and it's mm -hmm. not, again, like I was saying, it's not stale in comparison to a lot of the Hollywood stuff and it doesn't yeah. have to be bound by certain type of rules and stuff. Um, but it's also can be a little backwards <laughs> <laughs> and being a monoculture. And I think it's cause it's insular and, you know, and stuff like that. But you know, there's, there's one show I think I avoided doing that had like blackface as a major piece of its plot, you know, oh, wow. and I was just okay. like, well, <laughs> so. there, I guess, you know, <laughs> I guess we haven't come that far in any, no, in we any haven't culture come, yeah, at that point. <laughs> everything has come to, yeah, everything comes back to blackface apparently. So, <laughs> So, I mean, I, you know, I avoided it like a plague and, uh, fortunately, you know, I didn't, I didn't get involved with that, but, you know, but to, to know that that got greenlit and, you know, that's the norm and that's comedy to, yeah. for a lot of the audience, that's, um, something that's still a culture shock for me. Mm -hmm. And then still like, maybe, you know, it's, it's good that I can kind of hold on to that culture shock because it is still kind of weird. And so you have to kind of like, if you want to be all in and spend, all your time working there, you do have to kind of make the ju these judgment calls about what that means to, to cater and tell these stories to a local audience and what it means to not, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, a uh, it's, and you take each project as it comes. So it's, it's also kind of like that too. So, yeah, I mean, it's fraught with all these things that sometimes maybe if you don't have to worry about like this movie is not going to be seen outside the, the Vietnam, you know, just specifically, then maybe yeah. you don't have to worry about it. Maybe it's, but you know, history has a way of, you know, coming back and biting you in the ass. So, it, 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 oh, it does. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're such a connected society now too, where you yeah. know, everybody wants to see everything. So all it takes is, you know, one person saying like, Hey, I saw this Vietnam, Vietnamese show that featured, you know, this pretty. Bao was or, in it and it had a yeah. black face. <laughs> yeah. It's like, <laughs> what is going on here? What is he doing? Bao, but we were about to yeah. give you. 50, $50 million <laughs> project, but this one yeah. guy who caught a clip and put plastered on the internet and everything like that. Now it's a, a viral effect and everything. So. It is the thing. It is the thing. Yeah. And yeah. I, you know, I'm, and I don't mean to say it's just, you know, business decisions, certainly not, you know, if it doesn't jive with what you want to do or your values as an artist, I think we, yeah. should, we all need to listen to it uh, on first instinct versus, you know, calculating if it's going to help you or benefit you in the moment so yeah and i'm sure it's difficult to even kind of explain that to like an executive over there like hey you know in america we don't do this anymore and it's like <laughs> well well in vietnam we think this is funny it's like oh, well phew uh, I yeah step yeah. away from this and it's it, trying trying to kind of like retro act like change in some ways is still a very interesting thing but i mean um, I, I'm not sure if that came up in other times where it's like, Hey, here's my take on this. Like, are they open or like, are Vietnamese audiences or Vietnamese filmmakers like open to kind of like an American perspective on things? Or are they still kind of like, no, this is the way 
like we want to do the film and this is for us and not we don't want to really take any other culture cultural kind of consideration uh, mm -hmm. uh, if, if you will I don't, I don't know if you ran into that uh, over there as well or anything mm -hmm. um i think there's two things to that i think one is the uh what does it mean to learn the American way? Is it the American way of making a film or is mm -hmm. it the American way of making movies and telling, telling a certain a story, type of story? Yeah. yeah. Americanizing yeah. a story that's not supposed to be Americanized at all or anything. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I'll briefly touch on that because I haven't seen it, but I heard like Spike Lee's The Five Bloods or mm -hmm. what's, is that what it's called? Yeah, the Five the Bloods. Bloods. I don't even, I've yeah. been in an editing <laughs> cave for the last, literally you, like the last should, nine months up to <laughs> so the i don't know what's going on yeah up to the so 11th pandemic, hour i don't know i didn't get the memo um uh, but <laughs> but uh apparently it's a thing apparently it's a thing yeah <laughs> but you know the five bloods i i know i saw a lot of commentary with my vietnamese friends about you know it's conflicted because because spike lee is able to tell the story from a black american point of view and especially mm -hmm. about the war vietnam war which is not often portrayed from black soldiers um perspective yeah. Um, so there's 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 strength in that, but also the way they're portraying the Vietnamese and portraying the war is still from an American American how would you say the American side? You know, they're yeah, the American yes, yeah. military so, side. I, I can't even say the winning side, but just the side of the you know, if he had if it was Spike Lee would maybe co-directing with a Vietnamese director or somebody who can mm -hmm. inform him, but it's still from the american perspective but at least it's from the african Amer the african-american perspective which is yeah portrayed maybe in about two movies i can maybe name up yes, the top of my head exactly or something, yeah you know? yeah so. so there's a lot to unpack there and i know i'm not sure if you know i haven't seen the movie so i, I can't really chime mm -hmm. in but you know it does seem like you know all these issues about whose perspective are we talking about maybe that needs some clarity about who exactly we're talking about and whose perspective and who who has kind of the um what's the word i don't want to say liberty but who has kind of like the the who's who's telling that story from the place of strength and knowledge right yeah. mm -hmm. and be able to tell that so 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 there's that and then there's like i think i mentioned the mechanics of making a film mm -hmm. the mechanics are different i think that's what i would was really interested in bringing back here and shooting a film here in america is kind of bringing a little bit of the asian mentality of making films because i think there's a lot of power in that yeah. Um, whereas I think there's a lot of rules and departments and just everything's very like structured and ordered yeah. uh, here in the States, which kind of drives me nuts, frankly, but, um, all the red tape to have to cut through. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All the red tape. Yeah. So, you know, it's, 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 it was cool that we're in an indie where it's a little bit less buttoned down and obviously many people are wearing many hats. Um, so, but I, I there were definitely things that I kind of wanted to bring in terms of, um, the spirit of making a movie that was a little more um freewheeling i don't want to say free you know, like it wasn't like irresponsible and yeah. uh, we had planning but you know just something <laughs> a little bit looser especially for the actors and especially you know for for performances as well so you know that's kind of the balance in finding you know how you want to make a movie you know mechanically and all yeah. that so well, I mean, uh, I guess shifting gears to, you know, uh, two paper tigers, I mean, it is, it's a, you know, I, I don't want to say it's an old, it's an old school, it is kind of an old school kung fu flick with that 80s type vibe, you know, because I mean, obviously, I mean, you're, you're, you're a child of the 80s, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. So you grew up watching, you know, your, your uh, karate kid films and probably blood sport and everything else that had some sort of kung fu element i'm sure you go back to the classics like the shaw brothers uh, mm -hmm. and even you know all the bruce lee films um and you filming it in seattle also it made me automatically think of bruce lee most of the time because i remember going to seattle about six six or seven years ago and going to you know the graveyard where, where he's buried and everything and basically a shrine to bruce lee um, and there's a lot of allusions to just Bruce Lee and the way he kind of, uh, I can't speak for Bruce Lee because I don't know everything about him and everything he stood for, but a lot of like, it's a very honorable movie you created, I feel in a lot of ways. And I, I think that goes to the virtues of what Bruce Lee was about with his Kung Fu style and everything too. But you don't really bring up Bruce Lee in, in, in the film all that much. It's kind of a, a, a homage to like his life and his you know, his films and everything. 
But um, was that like a concerted effort where you're like, I don't want people to make, make a mistake like, oh, this is just my, my love letter to Bruce Lee. I want people to kind of that <laughs> exact thing. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm, I'm glad you picked up on uh, a lot of those things. It's uh, obviously, you know, we're in Seattle, so we're based mm -hmm. in Seattle, so we can't uh, escape that connection if we yeah. shoot, you know, <laughs> in Chinatown. It is, Seattle is pretty obviously um, where we are. So we definitely want to embrace it um, in terms of uh, what that meant for us spiritually, like you were saying, mm -hmm. but, it, you know, it definitely didn't have to be a real name check, you know, so, but it was in our DNA, but it didn't need to be on our sleeve. Yeah. Uh, let's put it that way so i think that's something that we definitely want to do and um the martial arts aspects of you know the honor and stuff like that was really uh important because it was also kind of an interesting way in terms of what it meant for again back to me as an asian american growing up in two cultures and just kind of like that tug and pull of mm -hmm. two values um and in this case just wanted to highlight it this value of martial arts this very arcane and almost very you know stiff and just kind of like really weird you know traditions yeah. <laughs> of what martial arts is and then like modern day and i that was always an interesting contrast because it is does feel that way oftentimes for a lot of asian americans to feel a certain way about asian culture and also a way that of of american culture even though we are americans but you know there is yeah. kind of this white american culture in terms of what we feel like we have to 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 uh, what's the word what's that word uh no they're yeah. talking about i uh, it skips my my uh we'll, my, we'll my, come my we'll come back we'll come back to that we'll come back to that <laughs> yes exactly code switch that's okay yes code switch. okay yeah so it's often a thing where we have to behave one way for some people and behave another way for a different set of cultures and stuff like that so yeah. um so in the same way martial arts world there is kind of like the code switch uh for our lead character for example mm -hmm. i think there's a lot of things around him where you know he's not the greatest uh, domestically at home with his father, with his son and his mm -hmm. ex-wife, but he co-switches with his brothers and he yeah. becomes this leader in a lot of ways. So uh, that's something that we wanted to explore. Yeah. Now with uh, you bring up Danny as like the main character. You have, you have Danny, you have Ming, and you have Jim, and they're they're all like very different characters, which I really appreciate. You you create this dynamic trio and. <laughs> I mean, I love the kind of like montage opening you kind of have where now, now grow, growing up in like the, like the Olympia or Seattle area. Now things are kind of happening like in the, you know, late eighties, mid, you no know, early nineties, mm -hmm. mid nineties and things like that. Did, it's almost kind of like a, a fight club martial arts, Kung Fu type of opening where people are just getting together. It looks like a video for like Michael Jackson's like beat it or something like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like everybody's meeting or something like that's like out of the warriors or something like that. Yep. Now yep. Um, growing up in your neighborhood or anything, were, were there, were, were things like that go, kind of going on in the neighborhood? Is that something you kind of like peeled back? Like, Oh, I remember this happening. So you kind of incorporated it into the film or is this kind of like, you know, how, how did you kind of create that opening and create that, Kind of like the fight i don't want to say fight culture but it is kind of like the kung fu fight culture mm -hmm. a little bit type thing you know yeah um i didn't personally because mm -hmm. i'm a book reading pacifist i stayed at home and studied and did got straight a's which as yeah. i should so really that's <laughs> i'm sticking, to it. I'm sticking yeah. to it i'm sticking to it i'm sticking to that story um but you know in terms of like what we experienced i think what you mentioned bruce lee it definitely that was kind of the historical homage because uh as you may or may not know you know bruce lee got in a lot of trouble as a youth in hong kong and these mm -hmm. and was in like these fight clubs yeah. uh between these kung fu clans and different schools and stuff like that and um the supposed story was that you know he had gotten in trouble with one of the um i think policemen's sons and and a fight or something uh or triads or one of those and that's how why he ended up being sent to america yeah to study because his parents were like oh this is too much uh, the so that was involved yeah you got to get out of here so <laughs> yeah so that, that's definitely you know that rough and tumble world that we kind of wanted to channel but also in hunk uh, in martial arts culture you know dojo busting is very much a piece of of the world where you just go around and you challenge other schools and you try to prove who's best and stuff like that 
and you try to close down the school because that means you get more students for yourself. <laughs> so like, 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 now you're, you know, now you're R, now, now, yeah, now yeah, R, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our seafood more, yeah, they is would, your you, seafood. You get it absorbed into, <laughs> yeah. It's a merger, you know, back in the day, it was just martial arts mergers. <laughs> martial there was nothing really, a, yeah. Hostile takeovers. And Hostile takeovers, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, in relation to that, what I did see was a lot of hip hop battles, you know, I did follow a lot of It made me think of, of that as well too, yeah. Definitely, yeah. And a lot of my friends did, uh, b-boying and battling and 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 ciphers and mm -hmm. all those things like that so i think that's just a parallel for youth culture i think when youth are learning something new and they're learning with their friends they want to show that they're better than that other group of friends over there <laughs> so yeah. i think it's it's just pretty universal as far as what that is so that's something that we definitely wanted to kind of like uh, pull from you know look wise you know and not put them in these traditional martial arts uniforms they're always in kind of like the urban clothes of the day kind of like, and what yeah, kids the would early wear. Early nineties, urban like it was either like cross colors or like you know. Yeah, exactly. Like that I was trying to find hyper colors. <laughs> oh man, yeah, I mean, trying to find them. Yeah, that would, have, that would have been something if you were able to just find like really long orange pants with the cross. Exactly, colors and like exactly. <laughs> and they were yeah, they're rocking flannels and all, and especially Seattle. You know, mm -hmm. we, that was kind of very grunge, grunge phase, and everything so, like yep. that. Yeah. Yep. So. Yeah. So, and also just kind of and skateboarding culture, and, you know, mm -hmm. especially the VHS um film uh filming style mm -hmm. like you know it was definitely just kind of like mishmash of just what i saw growing up among my friends and all the hobbies that they had and and it's really competition you know at the end of the day yeah. i mean i love how you met i mean i didn't think of like the rap battles and cypher stuff until you kind of brought it up because in, in the beginning they are just like talking shit to each other too it's like well, I'm going to do this and do this, especially, you know, <laughs> you know uh, especially with Carter and everything like that. It's like poor yep. Carter most of the time too. Um, yep. And the, the, the fight, the fighting look, I mean, when I was watching them, like these guys are like taking hits. Like what, what was the kind of, in terms of like stunt, like doing it stunt wise and doing it like legit. Cause some of those hits that they, like Carter was taking and some of the other guys were taking, like even like the karate guys, I think is, beat the shit out of it out of that one mm -hmm. montage in the beginning it's like damn they're, yeah they're taking some real licks so were you kind of like careful about making sure hey be make it real but don't like i, I don't need to be bruised up because i need you to keep doing this for doing it again <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's like <laughs> exactly. i can't have like in one scene it's like black eye it's like why well, you got a black eye here it's like it happened the other time or something like that yeah exactly <laughs> um well you know this is a testament to our action director ken kitagora who um um, you'll see somewhere in the film, but you know, he mainly is his work behind the camera was to kind of think about the action design and what you were saying, just to kind of be able to, um, make it fit the world that we were trying to make and not make it, you know, this is not Marvel, you know, they're not flying yeah. around and they're not crashing and punching through walls. So what does that mean? They get broken by the walls and stuff like that. <laughs> so if like, there's, there's something that, um, certainly went into the thought an approach and approach of his design and also training with the actors who did some, uh, some of them, most of them did have martial arts experience. And then we found uh, people who were just fighters and that mm -hmm. just needed, you know, were used to kind of like taking shots to the face so, yeah. <laughs> and stuff like that. So it's a little bit of like trying to like blur the lines in terms of like what they can do. And no one was hurt. Let's be clear. And no one, okay. we're all, everyone's fine. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't crash or send anyone into the hospital. So we were safe about it. But in terms of just kind of like finding those little thresholds, because, um, you know, I think people know when something feels fake, yeah. especially now when they see, you know, World Star and they oh, watch, you well, know, yeah, all these like, things like we're, we're very so MMA or whatever. Like we're very sensitive now if something feels fake for better, for worse. Um, yeah. But that's, you know, what we wanted to kind of like be aware of, like to make sure that it's sold. Um, so I'm glad to hear that you, you felt it was convincing and well, everyone was safe. So we did our job. So no, it, it looked legit. Like the, the, some of the hits and, uh, I know what talking about Carter again, I, Matthew page, I think did a great job Yeah. As, as car as grown up Sifu Carter, whatever you want to call him. Um, yeah. no, he, he has his web show and everything like that. Like the enter the dojo thing that he does now. Was that a deciding factor on hiring him on? Was it something that somebody brought to you? Like, Hey, Bao, this this guy, this Matthew Page guy, this guy's insane. He's he's he plays this weird dojo master, <laughs> billions of views on YouTube, and I just thought he was like the perfect addition. He was like the perfect foil 
to the three like the, the to uh to, to the three to the three uh the bro the three tigers, tigers three paper yeah. tigers if you want to yeah, say because yeah. he's yeah. like this self-righteous self-important like oh, i have the seafood now and everybody's like hey get the fuck out of here this is I, 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 i'm tired of you I'm, like you're not a seafood it's like oh yeah i'm a seafood <laughs> and, um, having them go back and forth was always to me that was a lot of fun too because it's not I don't want to say fish out of water story because it's like, he's like the kind of like the one main American actor you have who is kind of like stepped into the role of like a leader. Whereas the three tigers that you would expect to be leaders are like, yeah, no, sorry. I got a kid. I got a bad knee and I'm only doing MMA fighting right now. So mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. like the four of them, I'm not, like working together to me was also very entertaining. So are there any kind of like, between the four of them were they riffing off of each other it was a pretty tight script like how did that kind of work out with the four of them kind of going back and forth yeah absolutely i think it's a testament to their all the players and all the actors on that on that scene so you know it wasn't i i definitely left some room to for them to kind of play and riff and improv because i think that was a huge part of kind of how they were going to interact and the type of energy that they had with each other and the things that you described was exactly what we were trying to go, mm -hmm. go for. Um, uh, Matt, you know, obviously is, is a comic genius to me. I think he's fantastic. He's a really uh, fun talent to watch. And we had, saw, we hadn't seen the show just as fans uh, enter the dojo. We've just been watching it for, cause we've been at this movie for many, many years. <laughs> we've <Yeah. laughs> we've may, seen many stuff go on, but we track, we were walking to the show and we're tracking him and, and uh, we had talked to him, I think even a couple of years before, about it um but you know, only briefly because everything everything was still kind of like um still in the air at that point but yeah. once things got more real we started talking to him and um there wasn't really much other options as far as auditioning i, that, I always felt like he was the one and he felt he could do it and we and he seemed, he really liked the material and and was down for it as well so it was just kind of worked as far as the timing and just waiting for it to happen but um i i really I'm excited for him and, and I hope this does really well for him and, and gives him uh, these opportunities because I think, uh, you know, he has a lot of talent and he's really hardworking mm -hmm. as well. And so and the same goes for the rest of the cast for Elaine, D who plays Danny, Ron, who plays uh, Hing, and then Mikkel, who plays Jim. Mm -hmm. All four of them had this really great interplay together because yeah. we did um, <laughs> rehearsals and some improv that just kind of let them have some ideas about how it was going to go about and how they were going to interact but it's just kind of came out organic just the way they started teasing him like yeah. right away like i think remember we did a scene i just said okay we're gonna go back in time you're like 18 again <laughs> and it's friday night and you're gonna be at this mcdonald's the three tigers you're gonna be at mcdonald's and then uh carter's gonna come in and order you know his meal and unbeknownst you know you didn't expect to see each other but here you are and you're actually gonna fight a challenge fight the next day and just get that scheduled for the next night. So and then I just let them riff and it just started being so funny because they ended up being one side of the McDonald's and then Matt or Carter was on the other side of the and they were just like talking smack to each other across the way. And just like, and it was just funny. And it was just, um, I think someone had mentioned the takeaway of it was like, Carter wants to be a part of that group. Yeah. But he can't. <laughs> so it's like, it's that's the ever burning, you know, revenge passion for him is yeah. just wanted to be a part of the group, group but yeah. he can't exactly. and the three times we can have four times <laughs> yeah exactly so i think that's just like that was the conflict and that came out and and you know i you know hope the audience can be able to see and enjoy that because that's definitely what you know we were working on as well so yeah i love the interplay between matt and ron most of the time because i think ron brings the funny most of the, he's the one yeah it's it's how much Everybody has like their own little faults and everything like that. Obviously, when uh -huh. you're top of the world, and then you know you get into some of the backstory between between Jim and Danny and everything like that. There's a little bit kind of a deeper, you know, kind of anger. Not I don't say anger, but animosity between them and Ron mm -hmm. was always uh, uh, or uh, um, um, what is it? Ah, well, Ron's character. Sorry, you know, Hing. Yeah. Okay, Hing. Sorry about that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I go back and forth between actors and no problem. Yeah. <laughs> but he's always been like, kind of like the level head, level headed guy who kind of just got left behind. He kind of just stayed, stayed the person he was. He still studied his medicine and things like that, which I always thought 
I, I think that's always funny in, in the movie too when he does his medicine stuff too. It's like it's it's like this mystical thing yeah. that he does that it, it works and it, it works so well, especially when uh, they have they have their little uh, their tussle in the pool with the other uh, with the other uh, the youngins and everything like that. Yep. Too. Yep. But um, I, I love the, just the way they interplay and go back and forth because they seem like. I'm sure on set they were the ones probably going hard, hardest at each other, riffing and everything. Because it just yeah. comes off yeah. in the film that they were the ones that, okay, we're we're kind of like the the foils to the two self serious characters. We're the ones that are going to be kind of riffing and making the magic happen here too. So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they found those they found kind of their grooves uh, on their own, and in a lot of ways, just kind of like here's the characters, and they just started like committing to what that character is. Whereas Jim is like a little more of the silent brooding. Yeah. type and he's kind of checking out what danny's gonna do all because mm-hmm. danny's the he's the youngest and then danny's the you know oldest yeah. so he's always kind of like he doesn't want to join in this teasing even though it's funny but he's just trying to make sure it's cool yeah. danny's not cool with it. he's kind of like the the mom character is like oh my god you guys just <laughs> but he kind of participates as well and like you said it just really does come down to 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 carter and hang uh, going at it as far as that so yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, I know Ron, he, he's had an illustrious career and everything like that mm. in Hollywood and everything. So people mm-hmm. will automatically recognize him um, from, you know, he's going to be in Mulan and he's been in tons of other things too. So it's yep. great that you were able to get him on board and just have him do his thing because he was hilarious. He's just like the uh, the fly on the wall, but he's also kind of the audience in a lot of ways where you're looking at stuff. And he just points it out to you so easily. <laughs> <laughs> like that's what you should be looking at right now it's like yeah you're right you're right hey. that's cool yeah, that's exactly that's cool. what i'm looking at <laughs> <laughs> there you go there you go now yeah um, i'm excited for him too yeah I think just be able to have a role like this to, and he shines in this i'm really excited for him to be, for people to be able to see this different side of him yeah as well so now uh you said years to make this film how many years was the, was the paper tigers in the making uh from i guess I want to say mm. from conception to completion, but I guess we can kind of go go from there at this point. Yeah, I mean, uh, like you mentioned, uh, it was a little bit on and off at the beginning in terms of, but in terms of the idea that it had, I think it was about 2011. So I would, mm-hmm. you know, nine years now, um, nine odd years now, yeah. uh, just to be able to kind of like get to where we were. We had a script maybe about year, see, we're talking in years now, year four, year five, we had a script. Yeah. And then it was like kind of more committed development um, from for about four or five years after that as well. So, um, so uh, yeah, it was just kind of a whole process of just being able to work the script, obviously, and get it to the right place. And then and then starting to kind of develop in just the whole mechanics of it, of just mm-hmm. breaking down the script and scheduling and figuring out the budget and starting to pitch and trying to find the money and and how it's going to, how the money is going to be put together. Cause yeah. there's a million ways to, to put together a movie in this, uh, you know, in this world. So this was very independent. This was, um, we had to do a Kickstarter. We did some crowdfunding and we did some private money and all. So it was just like, it was a, all these uh, mishmash in terms of making the sausage yeah. um, <laughs> to get here. So, and then we went through, you know, the whole rigmarole. We did kind of do the Hollywood pitch tour and just try to, try to see how we could do with a studio interest. And we did that as well. And until we realized, you know, there wasn't uh, quite the traction that we were looking for and had to do it ourselves. And at the end of the day, you know, being able to, having to do it ourselves was really a privilege because we were able to do it ourselves and, and own it and, and, and basically have creative control. Yeah. No, no interference from anybody. It's like, well, hey, you should yeah. change that character and this character. It's like, no, we're not going to do that. This is the way we- it's supposed to be and uh you know sorry buddy you know you can keep your uh, extra money or something like that just finding the right people yeah. on you too because obviously you know getting the funding is the biggest probably hurdle at the end of the day i mean you can write a great script if you have it in your heart but to like have somebody here's money i trust you to do this your way it's like most of the time it's like here's money i trust you to do it the way i want you to do it most of the time too so yeah. Yeah. I can only imagine kind of this, that sort of relief sometimes when you receive, you know, funding and you can do it yourself though at the same time. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, yeah, it's one of those things that was painful, but you wouldn't have it any other way, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, knowing that what we were, had, were up against in terms of 
um, like you were saying, we did have some notes about like, you know, changing the races of the characters and changing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, trying to get a white guy into the lead roles and changing, changing out and get Bruce Willis or something, you know, it's just kind of like these very Hollywood. Get Bruce notes. Willis. He'll be really. Yeah. Interested. Get Bruce Willis. Period. <laughs> yeah. He'll, he'll make your movie. Um, so, you know, we had kind of all those asinine type of um, meetings and, and mm -hmm. It gave us clarity about the things that we did want and what we didn't want for the movie. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, it was just kind of all, it wasn't wasted time. It was just kind of took a while, but yeah. we, it gave us, you know, the things that we needed in terms of like the um, determination in terms of like, no, nope, we're not doing it that way. And then like realizing that this is the way to do it. Yeah. And there wasn't any ifs, ands, or buts about it. So, yep. So, and then you complete the film and now we have 2020, and I'm sure January 2020, it's like, yeah, this is going to be a great <laughs> year. Everything's looking fantastic. Yeah. Now we're sitting here uh, August, you know, uh, near the end of August, and Fantasia Fest, and everything's virtual, and mm -hmm. everything's online, and there's no actual screening screenings of everything. Um, how was that, I guess, when you're in the editing room finishing up the film, your first film? And you're getting to the point of, I'm, I'm editing this film, but it's not going to be, I mean, obviously not going to be seen the way you want it to be seen on a, on a, on a, on a screen, on a, on a movie screen with a crowd full of people laughing, cheering, doing whatever they're doing in the theater. Um, what, did, you, did you have any kind of like, you know, were you melancholy about that kind of near the end? Or is it like, look, you know, Obviously, this isn't the way I want to, but I finished this thing and people are still going to be able to see it because it's submitted and they're going to have a great time. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure it's emotional in so many different ways. And I'm, I'm sure it's a loaded question to ask you as well, too. So, but I'm just Yeah, curious, you know. it's um, no, I mean, that's that's one of the great um, sadnesses. And I think we're all on the same page. I'm not speaking out of turn, but it is yeah. one of the great sadnesses just not to be able to have this movie uh, seen with a crowd, because I do think it's, you know, it's a lot of fun with a big crowd to be able to see. And that's what we wanted to do, just have a big experience. Like that. So it is kind of like, that's, that was uh, a sadness that we have, but here we are. And I guess we try to make the best of it. And Pantasia has, you know, been really forthright and just proactive you know in terms of just saying we're going virtual very early on you know yeah. um and then they just you know committed to it whereas a lot of fests just said you know we're going to cancel and, and postpone so um you know they could have done it many different ways but they really committed to just like let's make it virtual and try to make the best of it so i really commend fantasia in terms of um what they have have been doing so far and they've been very accommodating with filmmakers and stuff like that and trying to create you know a live experience like you know obviously with around the screenings and try to mm -hmm. try to at least you know reclaim some of that experience back so you know, we're trying what we can um i do you know i do we're a little antsy like it's a little not knowing when we s people see this movie in their at, mm -hmm. in their homes and how the reaction is but maybe yeah. that's how people will make next netflix movies feel i don't know but maybe. it's like it's kind of the same but you know you don't really get a sense of that 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 immediate rush of just like if something is really playing well or not. <laughs> so yeah. it's like kind of, you kind of, you kind of really hope for that because I think that's kind of the joy of, of a movie is just being able to see something uh, and be taken on a journey together. So that is, that is, um, that is what it is where we are now. So um, uh, I think what's more, what we have to look forward to is just trying to find more opportunities. I think with drive-ins or, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So that's something that we really do want to kind of keep looking at and be able to figure out what we can still do in terms of just still having a way where we're all at least seeing the same things at the same yeah. time um, together in some, some capacity. And maybe that's, maybe that's, those are the things that we just have to kind of think around. But uh, I think everybody's trying to figure it out as they yeah. go here. So nobody really has real answers, but um, yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, mo I mean, South with South, South by Southwest when they canceled and everybody else seems to be canceled, like um, Tribeca and everything else. I mean, yeah, this is the first one that was kind of like fully virtual. I mean, earlier on in the year, I did, a, did a little work with the Chattanooga film festival here mm. in, in Tennessee and everything mm -hmm. was virtual there too. It was a much smaller film festival, more shorts, a few, you know, handful of movies and things like that. And they did a few kind of Q and A's and everything but everything was still held virtually. This one yeah. just seems to be, and, and I commend, you, know, you said it yourself, you know, commending the people at Fantasia for 
putting together such a large film festival and yeah. scaling it into this into this way where everybody can and everybody can see the movie. And what I find the most interesting is that will there continue to be a virtual aspect to film festivals going forward to open up the opportunities for the, the film to be seen more, to have more maybe more chance of distribution, not just to people that are at the film festival, but I say, oh, I wasn't able to make it to, you know, Quebec or Toronto or New York or something like that. And I can say, give you a call, shoot you an email, like, hey, I saw a screener for this. This is great. How's distribution deal sound for this? Like, wow, that's great. I didn't even have to leave my house or anything like that. Too. <laughs> so, I guess yeah. changing the commerce of uh, film festivals as well, too, making it a little bit more open to anybody. So, but to your well, point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, you know, in terms of the accessibility, I think that's something that maybe is just speeding up the tech along mm -hmm. where things weren't quite there or really needed a lot of nudging. So maybe that's the silver lining. Um, mm -hmm. And like you're saying, like a festival that would be normally to just the Montreal audience is now available to all of Canada. Maybe mm -hmm. that just kind of creates another access point that never would people wouldn't have afforded to go or wouldn't have, wouldn't have been able to 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 do otherwise so maybe that's something too and um and i think from an access like the literal accessibility standpoint you know when you said that it just kind of reminded me at sundance there was um there was a crip camp that was the film that had premiered at um at uh, sundance and it was mm -hmm. about um uh, these uh i guess kids that grew kids who grew up in a camp together that was a disabled for a disabled camp and, yeah. and just kind of the activism that grew out of it. Mm -hmm. It was a big celebration yeah. uh, for them. But I, I did recall there was a lot of chatter because like the, the after party was like in an old Sundance lodge that had no, um, no, no wheelchair ramps and um, no real like accessibility. I think, I so think there I was, remember kind of hearing about that too. I'm just going like, Ooh, that's not a good look. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so to that point, maybe this virtual kind of ups increases uh, the technology aspect of it, of just creating a little more accessibility and, and things that wouldn't have been nudged along if, you know, this hadn't, hadn't been happened. So, you know, maybe that's, those are all the silver linings around it. So, yeah. But at the same time, you know, that nothing beats sitting in a darkened theater, uh, watching the film together at the same screen, all the eyes on the, on the screen. And then, getting the immediate feedback. If you're in, you know, I'm sure you've sat in plenty of audiences watching your shorts or other things in uh, film festivals and getting that rush where people like the clap or the, Woo, everything goes on. It's like, I guess I could do that in my own house and everybody else yes. might be doing the same thing. Cause yeah. I know watching this film, there were definitely times where I was like, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm playing to myself, you know, I, and, and I'm like, damn, I wish you know, if, if I was in the same room with some other people, I'm sure they would appreciate yeah. it. Oh, yeah. so it's you can uh, always text me emojis. So okay, there's anything there. Yeah, you go, just, perfect. Just that. <laughs> yeah, it's the new, totally. the, new way, the new way of actually uh, getting my uh, my emotion across to people. Like exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I sent you an emoji. Don't like, you? Did you not get the emoji? Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, what was that? Oh, that was the fart emoji. Oh, okay. yeah. This movie made you fart. <laughs> Perfect. It gave you gas. I can't. I'm, exactly. How lovely. <laughs> exactly. Well, Bal, that's huge. Uh, I mean, for me, that was you know, seeing it. Audience reaction was kind of my big litmus test in how to figure out making movies and see what worked, whether you were pushing a button or where you were pulling them and taking them in places or not and taking me places. I, mm -hmm. you know, I just recall back to movies that I love taking me on a journey and, and what buttons they were pushing, you know, as far as that. And that was kind of like really, it was Pavlovian, right? He's trying yeah, to figure right? out how yeah. to make a movie and just like understand what all, all that was. It wasn't theoretical. I just, I'm obsessed with thinking about how, an audience is going to think about and react to it yeah and and just kind of like that type of thing so that's kind of like what really shapes uh the type of stories that we want to do so well i mean that we're, we're gonna we're, we're story you're, you're a storyteller we're all storytellers in our own different ways and everything yeah this, yep. this this podcast this interview is telling a story about kind yeah. of you know we've gone from vietnam to seattle to everywhere in between to um you know montreal for fantasia yep. Learning about people and learning about ourselves. Yeah. So thank exactly. you for allowing me to be on the journey with you, Val. I do appreciate it. So <laughs> thank you, Matt, for having me. This is a joy. Yep. Uh, so 
Paper Tigers will be premiering Fantasia this year on August 30th, I believe, correct? Yep. Am I right on that? So, Sunday, um, August 30th. Are you going to be doing any uh, post QA or anything like that for that? Like, is there anything you want to plug for the film leading up to the 30th? Uh, yeah. So the, the screening on the Sunday, uh, August 30th is our world premiere. It's going to be at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, and then we will have a Q and a for that screening uh, with me and the cast, uh, Elaine, Ron, Mikkel, and Matt. So stay Thanks. tuned right after the screening of that. And we'll have a fun Q and a, uh, hopefully people will still be up. <laughs> people still be awake so um yeah that's going to be a, a real fun time for all of us to try to plug in hopefully that's actually going to be the first time for them to see the movie as well so oh very um, cool. they right. could be on mute <laughs> for the whole <laughs> q a or they could be talking we'll find out um so stay tuned yeah this is a cliffhanger i don't know how it's gonna be what's <laughs> gonna happen on the 30th we're gonna exactly. find out <laughs> exactly so well there you go. um um Paper Tigers, something that definitely everybody should be proud of. I think it's a, just a fun, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fun, uplifting, buddy, nostalgic kung fu comedy in so many different ways. I mean, um, and this isn't taking anything away from other films I've watched at Fantasia so far, but everything is genre-based. So everything goes from thrillers to horror to this to that. And you're like the one film so far where I'm watching it, I'm like, Good. I'm, I feel less stressed right now. Like, you know, the only, you know, I don't, I don't feel like anxiety ridden or anything like that. It, it's just a really good film with, with some really good ideas and some really good, just, you know, I don't know. It, it, it's something about it. It's like, I don't want to say it's, it's wholesome because, you know, there's definitely fighting people are beating shit out of each other, but, <laughs> there, but there's still, you know, this idea of brotherhood and, you know, kind of coming together for, you know, a common, a common goal, a common, a common good and everything. And kind of learning, learning about, you know, growth is the main thing I would say about the film. So uh, thank you for releasing it and putting it into the world. And hopefully everybody's going to enjoy it this week. So hopefully as well. Yeah. I'm glad you liked it, man. Thank you. Yeah. That was very okay. nice words. Well, well, okay. Enough of that crap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, enough. Enough, enough of wholesomeness. Enough of this ass kissing that I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, thank you, Bal, for uh, joining us on uh, this episode of Simplistic Interviews. Um, we'll be back, I'm sure, with another interview uh, soon enough. But for the time being, I appreciate you coming on, my friend. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you.